Good morning, and uh, if you could be seated, please. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel this morning. Um, I'm going to start with reading Psalm 133. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron. Running down on the edge of his garments, it is like the dew of Hermon. Descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of meeting together this morning, Lord, in unity as your family, Lord. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. And as we come together this morning with open hearts, Lord, to worship you and to hear your word. And we pray your Holy Spirit would lead and guide us in all that's said and done this morning. We thank you for your love for us, Lord, and the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross of Calvary. And we pray our eyes would be centred on him this morning, Lord. Leave our problems behind us. And so we commit this morning to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please, let's stand and worship the Lord. We'll sing, crown him with many crowns.
God the Father. Let's sing. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. 
good to sing <laughs> about what we believe, isn't it? Amen. And that we have our hope in Christ. Amen. We're going to sing a song. I actually probably did it, but it's been probably over a year, so I'm going to remind you of it for those who were even here when we did this. I'm going to sing a song called Christ, Our Hope in Life and Death. And the chorus goes like this. It goes, Oh, sing hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah. Now and ever we confess Christ, our hope in life and death. Okay, try that with me. Oh, sing hallelujah. Oh,
good news we have <laughs> this morning. I'm just going to sing one more song as we continue worship. Maybe seated, we'll have our scripture reading at this time. Good morning. The psalm this morning is Psalm 42. And in my Bible, it's entitled, Yearning for God in the Mist of Distresses. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food, day and night, while they continually say to me, Where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me, for I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. 
Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me, therefore I will, will remember you from the land of the Jordan and from the heights of Hermon, from the hill Mizar. Deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls. All your waves and billows have gone over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with the breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Thanks be unto God for his word. We stand. We're going to sing the first part of that psalm together. Father, we just thank you that you are our strength and our shield. 
And we just thank you that we can worship you this morning in spirit and in truth. Our heart's desire is to know you more this morning. And we thank you that it's, it's only by your grace that we are saved and that Jesus, our sinless saviour, died on the cross so that we can be free from sin. You alone indeed are our strength and our comforter and we love you more than anything else and we give you the glory and the honour. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. A few announcements this morning. Um, Tuesday, we have the Little Lights meeting at 9.30, and followed by the coffee morning at 10 o'clock on Tuesday. Please do join us for coffee. Um, we might even go to cake as well. You never know. But uh, join us on Tuesday morning, if you've got children, little lights and coffee morning for a more adult meeting. On Wednesday, it's the home group meeting on Zoom. That starts at 7.30. And on Thursday, uh, we've got a joint home group meeting down here at the church. That's at 7.30. So 7.30, joint home group on Thursday. Friday, we have a movie premiere I'm sure you've read about it. The Morning Star film premiere, which is about the life and the work of John Wycliffe. So it's all free, and it's on Friday, the 2nd of December, and it starts here at 7.30 p.m. So please do come. Bring some friends. Bring some family, if you wish. And uh, hopefully uh, the actual director is going to be here. I've never met a film director, so that will be interesting, won't it? Murdo McLeod, his name is. So, anyway, and he'll be here to answer questions afterwards. And as I say, it's a free event, so please bring some friends. So that's Friday at 7.30 in the evening. <laughs> On Saturday, uh, starting at 8am, is the men's breakfast. Long time since we've had a men's breakfast. So uh, all you men, uh, if you could sign up, not because we want to know if you're coming, but we want numbers. We just want the total numbers so we know how to cater. So, men, if you can make it at 8 a.m., it's coffee at 8 a.m., and breakfast food, that is at 8.30, and then we'll have a, a time of fellowship afterwards. So please do join us, 8 a.m., but please do sign up so we know numbers. Um, now, the Christmas schedule is close on us now. Um, it's all in the uh, um, newsletter. Um, just briefly, Sunday the 4th is the youth Christmas party. Saturday the 10th is the ladies' Christmas lunch. That is also a sign-up event, so if you could, ladies, sign up as soon as you can. Uh, Sunday the 18th is a carol service, and Sunday the 25th is just a short Christmas service in the morning. So please do make a note of those in your diaries. Uh, that's all the notices, so uh, the, let's pray for the children and the youth before they leave us this morning. Lord, we just lift up the children and the youth of our fellowship this morning. Um, we pray for a blessing on them as they are instructed in your word. We just thank you for the commitment of the teachers as they instruct them, and we pray all that's said and done would be in accordance with your will. And we pray that firm foundations will be set in their hearts in this increasingly difficult world we live in. So we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the children and the youth can now leave us. And Steve will now continue in the book of Colossians. Well, thank you, Robin, and good morning to you all. It's uh, great to see you uh, on this Sunday 
morning. It's always good to gather together to worship our Lord and Savior together and to study his word together. And so if you have your Bible, please open with me to the book of Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Now we've spent quite some time here in the third chapter of Paul's letter to the Colossians because it's a very important chapter and a very practical chapter all about practical Christian living. It's the will and purpose of God for us to be conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ and thus for us to live lives that are like Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit whom God has given to us. And Colossians chapter 3 describes to us in quite some detail, some practical detail, what this Christ life like looks like. And so we've taken our time to consider uh, these wonderful and important uh, truths because it is vitally important that the spiritual reality of our faith in Jesus Christ becomes a practical reality in our everyday lives. The Christian faith is not just about what we know, but it's also about what we do. The Christian life isn't just uh, about gathering here together on a Sunday morning. It's about going out there into the world and living out the lives that God has called us to live. Our Christian faith and the truth of the word of God should touch every single area of our lives, whether it's our personal lives, our home lives, our family lives, our work lives, our social lives. The truth of God's word should permeate every area of our lives. And so we've been working our way through this wonderful uh, chapter uh, and we, we've seen and been encouraged and exhorted in many uh, practical uh, matters. Uh, and over the last couple of weeks, we've been uh, considering verses 15, 16, and 17, which really form the, the conclusion of Paul's general section of exhortation to the church to live a Christ-like life. And he concludes this section by giving us three priorities for life and ministry in the church. Number one, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, verse 15. Number two, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, verse 16. And thirdly, let the name of Christ guide you in everything that you do, verse 17. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we've covered verses 15 and 16. And last week, we touched on verse 16. 17, but this morning, as we sort of wrap up this uh, general section of exhortation, we're going to uh, consider a couple of vitally important truths that Paul exhorts us towards here in Colossians 3, verse 17. Uh, and so that is our text for this morning, Colossians 3, verse 17. Uh, if you've got your Bible, follow along with me as I read the verse. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word to us today. We ask by your spirit that you would speak into our hearts and lives, that you would teach us, so that we might be encouraged and strengthened so that we might grow in our knowledge of you and our knowledge of your will and purpose for each and every one of us here in this world. And so, Father, we thank you for your word this morning, and we ask by your spirit you would bless your word to our hearts, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so the third concluding exhortation of this general uh, passage of exhortations here in Colossians 3 verse 17 is in essence let the word let the word of Christ or rather sorry let the name of Christ let the name of Christ guide you in everything that you 
do. And as we look at verse 17, uh, we really see two important principles. Two important principles which really sum up um, the entirety of what Paul has been saying here in Colossians chapter 3. Uh, two important principles that really sum up the entirety of the Christian life. Uh, the first one is that we are to live lives that are pleasing to God. And secondly, that we are to live lives that are thankful to God. Lives that are pleasing to the Lord and lives that are thankful to the Lord. And so these are our two points here in our text this morning. So let's just consider that first point. We are to live lives that are pleasing to the Lord. Take a look again at verse 17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now last week, as we considered verse 16... Uh, we spent quite a bit of time talking about worship in song. Uh, Paul said in verse 16 that we are to worship the Lord in song. We are to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and we are to sing with grace in our hearts uh, to the Lord. And indeed, how wonderful it is to sing together as the people of God, to sing together in unity uh, the praises of God. It's a wonderful thing and a wonderful expression of true Christian worship. Uh, but last week we also mentioned how unfortunate it is that oftentimes in uh, the evangelical Christian world, uh, the singing portion of our church services are often referred to as the worship, quote unquote. And that is because, uh, well it's not because singing is not worship, indeed it is, but of course uh, singing is just one form of worship. Uh, our entire service uh, here is a worship service. When we pray, we are worshipping. When we read the scriptures, we are declaring the truth of God. We are worshipping the Lord. When we study God's word, we are proclaiming the truth of God's word. And we are worshipping. And so we worship in prayer. We worship through the reading of God's word. We worship through the teaching of God's word. Uh, we worship through the singing uh, of songs. Um, worship is what we do the whole time we are together. But of course, our worship lives are not limited to our time together as a church on a Sunday. Uh, and this is what Paul is telling us here in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17. He talks about worship in song. Yes, we are to worship in song. That's great and that's wonderful uh, to offer our heartfelt worship to the Lord uh, in song. But our, our worship life goes beyond our singing. It goes beyond our church services. It goes beyond our Sundays and it extends to all of life. Notice there in verse 17, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Whatever you do, in word or deed. Now that is a pretty comprehensive statement. It covers pretty much everything. Whatever you do, in word, whether it be teaching the Bible, whether it be praying for somebody, Whatever you do indeed, whether it be here in church, whether it be at home, whether it be at work, uh, these words encompass the entirety of life. Everything that we do, everything that we say. And so worship in our lives is not just about singing, it's about all of life. It's not just about what we say and do in church. It's about what we say and do every moment of every day. It's not just about Sundays. It's about every day of the week. We are to live lives of worship unto the Lord. Uh, and perhaps the most well-known uh, statement of this truth is found in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, in which the Apostle Paul says, 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And that word service there could be translated worship. You see, the Apostle Paul there is drawing on the language of Old Testament worship which is the language of sacrifice. Back in the Old Testament, if somebody wanted to come and worship the Lord, they would bring a a sacrifice. They would bring an offering and they would come to the tabernacle or they would later come to the temple and they'd they'd bring their sacrifice, their their, their bull or their, their goat or whatever it was, and they would bring and they would offer that sacrifice uh, as worship unto uh, the Lord. And and what Paul is saying there in Romans chapter 12 is that um, Christ offered himself as a sacrifice for you. Now you, in response, are to offer your lives as a sacrifice in worship unto him. And it is only right and reasonable that that be the case because of all that Christ has done for you. And so our life of worship then is a response to God, a response to who God is, a response to what God has done for us. And the only right response to who God is and what God has done for us in Christ is to respond by living lives wholly committed to loving and serving him, lives of living sacrifice. Lives that are committed to pleasing him, serving him, and obeying him. And this is really the point that Paul is making here in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, when he says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, uh, that's an interesting phrase, an important phrase in the Bible. Uh, the name of the Lord. Uh, We read that phrase, the name of the Lord, repeatedly throughout the Old Testament uh, to refer to God, of course. Uh, Here, this phrase is applied to Jesus, uh, and in line with the high Christology of this entire letter exalting Jesus, uh, it is not surprising that we see the Apostle Paul um, equating uh, Jesus uh, with the Lord God of the Old Testament, because indeed Jesus is God. But we see here, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. This phrase, the name of the Lord, in the Old Testament, it usually carried the idea uh, of of the character and the nature of God. When you refer to the name of the Lord, you're talking about who God is. So, for example, uh, it says in the Old Testament that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Okay, that doesn't mean that the Lord's name is Mr. First Name Strong, Second Name Tower. Oh, hi, Mr. Tower. How are you doing? Okay, it's speaking of the character and the nature of God. And the fact that the Lord is a strong uh, tower, the righteous run into it, and, and there they are safe, right? It's talking about an aspect of God's character and an aspect of God's nature. God is all-powerful and he's all-loving. And in the Lord, there is protection. And in the Lord, there is safety. It points us to the character and the nature of God. And so um, here we, we have this same phrase, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, uh, which means, in essence, that we are to live lives that are consistent with the character and the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to live lives that are like Christ. We are to live lives that are pleasing to God. Uh, Another aspect of this phrase, the name of the Lord uh, in the Old Testament, is is it can carry the idea of coming under the authority of somebody. You come under the name of the person. You come under the authority of the person. And that kind of fits quite well here as another uh, aspect of this in that we are called to live lives that are submitted to the authority of Jesus. We are to live lives of obedience uh, to the Lord Jesus. And so we have here worship on the one hand, but we also have obedience then on the other, living a life that is pleasing 
to the Lord. And obedience is, in essence, what is pleasing to the Lord. And obedience is sacrifice because when we choose to obey the Lord, we are choosing to do not what I want, but we're choosing to do what God wants. And so we have sacrifice, we have obedience, we have worship, and they all go together hand in hand. And perhaps the, the, the big idea um, of this verse is summarized quite well for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, in a very similar, uh, similar verse in which Paul said, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So there it is. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Everything that you do should be consistent with the character and the nature of Jesus. And as we do that, everything we do will be done unto the glory of the Lord. And so the entirety of our lives are to be lived as an act of worship unto the Lord, bringing glory to the Lord, living lives that are pleasing to the Lord. Now, this whole idea then of living our lives as an act of worship to the Lord um, becomes very practical and indeed very helpful for us in our day-to-day -day lives. When we think of life, when we think of our lives and we think of all the things that we do in our lives and all the people that we have relationships with and all the places uh, that we go, it is very helpful, indeed important for us, to think about all of those things in the context of worship. In the context of being an act of worship. Now, uh, one thing that some people often ask as, as Christians is they say, okay, well, I know the Bible says, you know, this is wrong and this is sin, so that's not right. And I know the Bible says this is good. You know, but there's some other things that I'm not sure if it's okay for me to do or not. Is it okay for me to do this? Is it okay for me to do that? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure. And oftentimes people like to, you know, want to push the boundaries a little bit and think, okay, well, you know, can I do this while still being able to say I'm not doing that? You know, that kind of thing. And, um, and, and as Christians, of course, we have great liberty in Christ. Um, all things are lawful for us, but not all things are helpful. And so oftentimes we make decisions in life about things that we do or places that we go. And it might not necessarily be a clear-cut uh, issue of, of right or wrong that's black and white, but maybe it's an issue of practical Christian wisdom. And, and, and we're sort of thinking, well, is it, should I do this or sh should I not do that? And one question that can help us is really the question of worship. Is can I do that as an act of worship to the Lord? Good question to ask. If everything I do in life is to be done as an act of worship to the Lord, if this one thing that I'm thinking about doing, and I'm thinking whether I should do it or not, can I do it as an act of worship to the Lord? And that might bring a little bit of clarity to the situation. And that can be very helpful. Another problem that we often face in the Christian life is that, that we follow um, a, a distinction that's often described as, as the distinction between the sacred on one hand and the secular on the other. So we come to church to worship, okay, sacred, spiritual. But then tomorrow morning we go to work. Okay, well, that's secular, that's, that's different, that's something else. Um, you know, we, we come to church and, and we sing songs of praise and worship. Then we go home and then we change nappies and feed the kids. Okay, one thing, it, it's a joy and a blessing. The other thing, well, that's a bit more tedious. That's a bit more uh, mundane. That's a bit messy um, and so on. And... and and oftentimes we can think about worship in the context of coming to church, but we don't think about worship in the context of changing nappies. Now you might think, well, you know, what, what's worshipful about changing nappies? Well, here's the thing. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Whether you eat, whether you drink, whatever it is you do, do all unto the glory of God. And you see, what this does then is it puts everything 
we do, putting it in a context of worship, then allows me then to examine my own heart in everything that I do. Am I doing this begrudgingly? Am I annoyed and frustrated? Or am I doing it heartily unto the Lord? And sometimes we make this separation, okay? Church, worship, spiritual, okay, we, we do that unto the Lord, that's worship, but, you know, work, practical, kids or whatever, well, well that's kind of not so spiritual, so we just kind of get on with it without too much uh, thought. But you see here that there is no sacred secular distinction uh, in the Bible. Um, we don't see it here. We don't see it in 1 Corinthians 10. We didn't see it in Romans 12. It's about the entirety of our lives. It's about everything that we do. Uh, there is no distinction between the spiritual and the practical in that sense, between the sacred um, and the, the, the secular. Uh, and this is Paul's point, really, in the entire chapter, that, that we have new life in Christ. And that new life now should impact every single area of our lives practically. It should bring about uh, a change of attitude, of heart, of behavior in everything that we do. Not just in the spiritual sacred things, but also in the, the practical things. Also at home, in our relationship with our children or with our spouse and at work. Uh, how we work in our relationship with our work colleagues. You know, at school, uh, wherever it may be be the big things the small things things that we see as high and spiritual other things that we see as you know boring and mundane but when we do everything heartily as unto the lord even the most mundane tedious things become elevated because the manner in which we do them and the heart with which we have before the lord can elevate those mundane things into a real, true, spiritual act of worship. And so it's a really helpful thing for us to think about everything we do in the context of worship. And that will help us keep a check on our own hearts before uh, the Lord. Now, this is what Paul will go on to do in the next section, in really the final section of exhortations in this letter, in verses 18 uh, through to chapter 4, verse 1, in which Paul gives some very specific exhortations concerning uh, what would have been in those days the Christian household. And indeed uh, is uh, a Christian home, but we also have um, uh, the, the workplace in our modern day uh, context. Uh, but just in, in, in those sections, just to mention briefly, um, back in the ancient Roman home, there were typically three relationships that existed uh, within the household. There was the relationship between the husband and the wife. There was the relationship between the parents and the children. And then there was the relationship between the, the master and the servants or the slaves. And, and, and all those relationships would exist as part of a typical uh, household. Now, we'll, we'll get into all of those things when we come to uh, to, to the passage. But what Paul does in, in speaking about all of those relationships um, is he elevates those relationships as really um, acts of worship unto the Lord. Uh, and, and, and you see this in verse 18, wives submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Okay, so it's not really about your husband, it's about the Lord, right? It's about an act of worship before the Lord goes down to children, obey your parents in all things. Why? For this is well-pleasing in the Lord. Okay, so it's not really about your parents as much as it is about pleasing and worshiping the Lord. Down in verse 23, the, the servants, you know, work hard, work well. Whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. You know, when we go to work, when we go to school, wherever the case may be, and we work hard, yes, we might be working for our teacher, we might be working for our boss, and so on and so forth, but if you're a Christian, ultimately you're really working unto the Lord. And so again, that sort of elevates our sort of secular work unto a spiritual act of worship before the Lord. And so Christ then is at the heart of all of these relationships. Christ is at the heart of our lives of worship. And so, and, and we'll come on to the details of all of that in 
uh, future uh, studies. Uh, but just practically then, as we sort of wrap up this and move on to the next point, the, the question we need to ask ourselves is, are, are we living lives as an act of worship unto the Lord in everything that we do? In our relationships, in our workplace, are we working heartily as unto the Lord? Are we parenting our children as an act of worship to the Lord? Are we loving our spouse as an act of worship unto the Lord? We could go on and on with the practical applications uh, of that. And sometimes those questions are not necessarily you know, easy to, to, to answer um, you know, for a whole variety of of reason. Sometimes it can be quite difficult for us to discern the thoughts and intents of our hearts. Um, uh, but you know who's good at discerning the thoughts and intents of the heart? Okay, the Lord through his word, okay, says in Hebrews chapter 4 that the word of God is living and powerful. It's sharp and then he two-edged thought. And one other thing the word of God does is it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So we need to find ourselves in the word of God. And examine our lives, everything that we do in every area of our life in light of the word of God. And allow the Lord by his spirit to convict our hearts. Where we fall short and where we are not living lives as an act of worship. And maybe where we're kind of frustrated and, and, and we're begrudging this and that and the other. And, and to take that on board. And, and to uh, accept and receive and respond to that conviction of the spirit through his word. And confess any sin before the Lord and receive his forgiveness and ask for his help to move forward uh, with a different mind and a different heart to, to do these things as an act of worship unto the glory of God. Well, we are to live our lives as lives that are pleasing uh, to the Lord. And then at the end of verse 17, we have this wonderful little phrase, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So not only are we to live lives that are, are pleasing to God as acts of worship, but we are to live lives that are thankful to God. Giving thanks to God the Father through him, that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the word thanks, given, it's a wonderful word. Um, the, the, the Greek word that, that's translated here is a word you'll have heard before because it's the, the word uh, Eucharist. I'm sure you've all heard the word uh, Eucharist, oftentimes, uh, you know, in, in, particularly in more liturgical churches, perhaps, um, uh, that the Eucharist is, is what we would refer to as communion or the Lord's table. And, and the word means the giving of thanks. Um, you and charis, you is good, charis is grace, uh, good, good grace. Um, and um, it's where we get the word eulogy as well, in, 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 incidentally. You, you know, good, you, you speak to speak well of somebody. It's, it's kind of that idea. And so, so when we're giving thanks to God, we're, you know, we're, we're speaking good, good of God. We're, we're thanking God for his good grace and favor uh, toward us. And interestingly as well, this um, is in the present tense, which speaks of continual action or really a continual attitude. So, so we are to uh, continually be given thanks uh, to the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so, so there's never a moment we are not to be given thanks. Um, and our thanks are to God through uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and that is because it is through the Lord Jesus Christ that all the blessings of God have come uh, to us. It is through the Lord Jesus Christ that we have access to God uh, at all, and we, we thank God uh, in and through uh, the Lord uh, Jesus Christ uh, for all that he has done for us. And, um, uh, and, and this, of course, is, is not just um, commanded of us here. Um, it's actually a, a regular theme uh, of Scripture, this theme of giving thanks uh, to uh, the Lord. And, um, you know, many uh, of, of the verses that, that we read, I mean, you go read through the Psalms, you know, give thanks to the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, give thanks to the Lord. And it's vitally important that we do give thanks to the Lord uh, as Christians for at least two reasons. Uh, the first reason 
is because there is so much for us to be thankful for. So much for us to be thankful for. You know, many of the commands in the Bible about thanksgiving go on to give reasons why we are to give thanks. Uh, we see this um, uh, commonly in the Psalms. Psalm 136, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good and his love endures forever. Okay? So is there ever a time where God is not good? No. So is there ever a time that we cannot thank God for his goodness? No. Is there ever a time where God's love does not endure? It endures forever. So is there ever a time that we can't give thanks to God for his enduring love? No. Psalm 100, give thanks to the Lord. His mercy is everlasting. You know, I, I like this. His love endures forever. His mercy is everlasting. Again, it's this idea, right? Is there ever a time where we can't thank God for his mercies? In fact, his mercies are new every morning. And so, so we see here um, this idea of giving thanks continually makes a lot of sense when we understand who God is and, and what he has done. And, and you know, we, we can break this down, and this is a good thing to do, actually. Maybe I'd encourage you to do this week, to just take some time. Uh, when you get some quiet time, just sit down and just make a note of all the things that, that you're thankful to the Lord for. And just think about it. You know, we could, we could start with our salvation. That's a good place to start, isn't it? Forgiveness of sins. We can thank God for his grace, his grace by which we've been saved, his grace in which we stand, his grace which is sufficient uh, to, to strengthen us in our times of need. We can thank God for his uh, provision and and for his favor, I mean, the, the list goes on and on. And, 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 and this is an important thing, and I, and I, I do believe it's an important uh, practice for us as Christians to spend time with the Lord each day in thanksgiving. It, it, it sets our hearts in the right place uh, before the Lord, being thankful to him. And that, that, that that's, brings us then to the second reason why giving thanks continually is so important, is because a heart of thanksgiving guards us against the dangers of unthankfulness or ingratitude. Because there is a danger for us as Christians if we neglect thanksgiving in our lives. On, on one side of things, it may mean that we begin to take things for granted. It can mean we start to take people for granted. Uh, and we neglect to give thanks where thanks is due. But on the other side of things, it can get worse than that. Because if we neglect thanksgiving in our hearts and lives, that can lead us then to focusing more upon what we don't have than what we do have. It can lead us to focus on more upon what God hasn't given us than on what he has given us and that in turn then can start a root of bitterness in our hearts it can lead to resentment it can lead to anger all these kinds of things that's why in first thessalonians chapter 5 verse 18 paul very specifically says in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In everything, give thanks. The idea there is be thankful in the midst of all of your circumstances. Whatever the circumstances may be in your life right now, give thanks to the Lord. Now you might say, well, hang on a second. My circumstances right now are not very good. In fact, my life right now is very hard for a whole host of reasons. So how on earth can I be thankful to the Lord when everything seems to be going wrong? Where I seem to be struggling, you know, with, with everything, when, when life is so hard. But you see, it's when that is the case. It is when times are hard. It's when we're struggling that is, it is the most important that we are continually thankful to the Lord. Because an absence of thankfulness to the Lord 
in those circumstances inevitably leads us towards bitterness and towards resentment. And that is a very dangerous road for the believer. But as we focus our hearts and minds upon the Lord, as we turn our eyes upon Jesus, as we consider who he is and what he has done for us, And as our hearts then rise in thanksgiving to God, then our focus begins to change. And then our hearts begin to change. Then bitterness and anger and all those things are kept at bay. Because really, you can't be truly thankful and bitter at the same time. You can't be truly thankful and angry at the same time. Those two things, they they don't coexist at the same time. And so a heart of thankfulness is so, so important, especially when we're going through difficult times. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean that when we're going through difficult times, we, we thank God, you know, for all the bad things that are happening to us. But Lord, I'm, I'm so thankful that somebody, you know, said something to me that was absolutely horrible and as if that's some kind of a good thing. If somebody sins against you or that there's evil around and and you felt the force of that, you know, that's not a good thing. That's a bad thing. And we can recognize that before the Lord. But what we can thank the Lord for is his sustaining power in helping us deal with that. What we can thank the Lord for is for his grace and the strength that he gives us to endure those kinds of things. What we can thank God for and what we can stand firm upon are upon the many promises that God has given us in his word. Such as Romans chapter 8 verse 28. That God is working all things together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. And his purpose ultimately, don't forget, is to conform you into the image of Christ. That's his purpose. And if we can look at all our circumstances in life, in light of that truth, in light of that reality, the good circumstances and the bad circumstances, and we can see that the Lord and recognize that the Lord is using those and the Lord is working through those, even if it's hard and even if I don't like it and even if people have been horrible and even if the circumstances are dreadful, If in the midst of all of those things, we can see Jesus. I might not understand it. I might not know why all these things are happening. But as uh, Pastor Chuck Smith always used to say, when we come across something that we don't understand, it's so important that we fall back on what we do understand. And I might not understand why my circumstances are the way they are. But what I do understand is that God is good. What I do understand is that God loves me. And what I do understand is I know that is true because Christ died on the cross for me. And I do know that God is working all things together for good according to his will and purpose. I do know God is at work in my heart and life and God is working uh, even through my life to accomplish his purposes in the lives of others. I might not necessarily see it. I might not necessarily understand it. I might not necessarily like it. But I can depend and trust upon the promises of God in the midst of all of those things. And for those promises, I can give thanks. That God can take the most horrendous situations and he can redeem them for his glory and his purposes. It's an incredible thing. And so, be thankful. Be thankful in all that we do. Keep our eyes upon Jesus, even in the bad times, especially in the hard times. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Commit yourself to living a life that is pleasing to the Lord. Commit yourself to living a life that is thankful uh, to the Lord, knowing that the Lord is with you, And that he'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you. And as we pass through this life, and we are just passing through, we can keep our eyes on eternity. Because one day, all of this will be done. 
one day Jesus is coming back. One day we will see Jesus. And when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he truly is. And in the Lord's presence, you know, there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there is pleasures forevermore. That is our destiny. That is where we are heading. So let us live this life, lives that are pleasing to the Lord, lives that are thankful to the Lord, knowing where we are going, knowing where we are headed into the arms of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word to us today. I pray that you would bless your word uh, to each and every one of our hearts. Father, help us, Lord, to live lives that are pleasing to you. Lord, we recognize that we struggle, Lord, with our flesh. We struggle with the temptations of the world that are around us every day. But Father, help us as we resolve afresh this day that we want to serve you, that we want to love you, that we want to be used by you for the building up of your church and the furtherance of your kingdom. And so, Father, help us by your Spirit. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, I pray, to enable us and empower us to live those lives of obedience unto you in every area of our life. Every area of our life is an act of worship to you. And help us to stay thankful. Help us to keep our eyes upon Jesus. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's all stand together. We'll sing a closing song. to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us to him be glory in the church by christ jesus to all generations forever and ever amen amen may god bless you all